Hi guys, today we wanted to give you a quick overview of oligopolies. Uh, there are other videos on the internet that are uh, going to go more in depth than this, but this will give you a, a rough overview so that then if you do choose to go more in depth, you're already sort of set. The key idea with uh, an oligopoly, of course, is that there are few. Uh, oligos means few in Greek, and so an oligopoly is a uh, group where there is a market structure where there are only a few firms. And the reason why there are only a few firms is because there are high barriers to entry and exit. And so the products that they are selling might be homogeneous or heterogeneous, but if they are heterogeneous, if they are differentiated, they're very close substitutes of one another. Um, now it's in the oligopolists' mm, interests to make you think that their product is less substitutable from other people's products because that gives them a little mini monopoly of their product. Um, but really, they are very substitutable. Uh, usually, we, if you have to define an oligopoly, you can just define it by the 40 by 4 ratio. So that the idea that if 40% of the market is controlled by four or fewer firms, then you have an oligopoly. Um, that's just called the concentration ratio, and that's just something somebody made up. I mean, that's not, sci that's not scientific, but we do use it. Because there are so few firms in the market, the oligopolist is mutually interdependent upon his competitors, which means that his actions can either benefit or harm uh, the other actions of the other oligopolists. So this leads people to engage in strategic behavior, where they will try, um, you know, much like two sports teams can can try to to well, beat each other, or in the case of mm, maybe sort of a corrupt sports team, you could have them both plan on having one team win or the other team win, depending on if uh, they were sort of fixing the match. And the same thing can happen in oligopoly, um, about whether they should work together or about whether they should work against each other. And we see that tension over and over in oligopolies. This tension is, to, is something that's studied uh, in something called game theory. Uh, and game theory uh, presents us with two really good uh, ways of thinking um, about how an oligopoly works. And these are, these are famous thought experiments. The first is called the prisoner's dilemma. And I think what I'll actually do is there are much better, much more high-tech videos uh, than this um, that I would recommend that you, you watch if, you're, if you haven't heard of the prisoner's dilemma before. But essentially in this, when you have two people acting independently from one another, the best thing for both of them would be to work together, but their most logical course of action will cause the most negative outcome for them. Um, so they should work together, but if they, if they don't trust each other, then they'll both default to the worst possible outcome. This is also was described uh, by a mathematician whose name was Nash, and he described something called Nash's equilibrium. And there's another, uh, uh, there are also great videos on uh, the Nash equilibrium. Uh, but this essentially says that uh, in a competitive system, competitors only reach an equilibrium when no action of their competitor can make them worse off. So they don't maximize their efficiency, they minimize their risk of, uh, of being uh, beaten or by, uh, of selling less goods. So again, both of those lead to essentially to market failure. Um, when you have mutual interdependence, uh, there are sort of three outcomes. You can have oligopolies come together and choose to work together and choose to set a higher price than they might otherwise set. A great example of this is OPEC, or the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Uh, they come together, they meet, they decide where to set that supply curve, um, and that's how they set prices. You can also have tacit or informal collusion, uh, where you can have a big price leader who might... Uh, set the price, and then you have a smaller group of people who might choose to take the price. Uh, examples of this might be airlines in certain markets, uh, where airlines are very reticent to, to fight uh, on price, and so are much more likely um, to compete for other aspects other, th other than price. And then there are non-inclusive oligopolies, where there's no collusion whatsoever. Um, they don't agree, they don't fix prices, they don't collaborate in any way. And this is the way that airlines certainly claim to be. Uh, if that makes sense, because really collusive oligopolies are, are illegal. Um, if you're in open collusion, we call that a cartel. Uh, and so OPEC is considered a cartel. Um, either way, whether you're in formal or informal um, collusion, 
there's an incentive for each individual monopolist to lower her price just a tiny bit because then, well, I guess I shouldn't say to lower her price, to increase her supply so that she can get more of the market. But of course, if everybody increases supply, that'll push the price down and will hurt everyone. So there's an incentive for each individual to cheat, but there's an incentive for the group to maintain uh, cohesion. Now, the reason why non-collusive oligopolies try not to change prices is essentially because of the kinked demand curve. And I think I might actually try to, uh, try to draw this for you uh, right here. Essentially, normally a demand curve would look like that. Um, oh, that's confusing. That's annoying. It's doing, uh, sorry. It's project, it's, uh, I'm using a program and it's like flipping the mirror image. So I think what I'll do is I'll have you look in your packet and you can take a look at figure 7.25 and you'll see the kinked demand curve. And the idea here is that uh, in this firm, oh, this is sort of funny, like we can do a, Um, perfect. Um, so what we'll do here is if we have a kinked demand curve, the idea of this is that the demand curve, though usually uh, just has a, having a negative slope, there's a portion of it where it goes totally vertical. And the reason why it goes vertical there is because for everyone else in the oligopoly, if they lower prices, all of the other op oligopolists will also lower prices and therefore the quantity won't increase. So the kinked demand curve shows that for each individual, the curve there is highly, highly inelastic with a low PED. So the marginal revenue curve for the non-clusive oligopolist essentially has a break in it. Um, and it, so it's really just um, And so they're really incentivized no matter what to produce, and again, if you're looking at your chart, to produce at Q1 whether the price level is P1 or whether the price level were to drop uh, dramatically. So because of this, there are three big features that we see in oligopolies. Non-collusive oligopolies really resist price changes. And the key thing that happens here is that oligopolies find other ways to compete with each other um, instead of price. And so you can see this with like beer companies, for example. Advertising is a huge part of, uh, of beer company revenues. You can see airlines compete with, uh, you know, um, those little frequent flyer cards and things like that. Um, they don't want to compete on price because if they do, they'll hit that kinked part of the demand curve and everybody will, um, will lose money. So there's an incentive not to do that. All right, so that is, uh, that's a quick, quick overview of oligopolies. Uh, and um, we'll also try to include for you a couple suggestions of links for the prisoner's dilemma and for the Nash equilibrium.